thank you. So good morning to all attendees, dear colleagues, dear friends. Um, I would uh, first of all like to congratulate the person who has worked as the main investigator of this symposium. I mean Nello Schult from Ghent University, who suggested the topic and who contacted me some months ago to uh, inquire whether I would be willing to co-organize the event at the University of Strasbourg. And here we are. N uh, I know Nella has put a lot of time and energy into this symposium, so thanks again. I'm very pleased to announce that great speakers and chairs, experts in climate science, legal sciences, history of sciences, scientific mediation, have agreed to give a talk today. So many thanks to all of you. Nella and myself are very honored also to have members of the European Court of Human Rights with us today, joining us as speakers and audience. As you probably are aware of, some climate cases are currently pending before the Strasbourg Court, but it is perfectly clear that we are not allowed to mention them as they have so far not been dealt with by the court itself. Before saying a few words about the topic, I would also like to welcome all participants online on the YouTube channel of Emisha. I must say we have had a big success so far attracting nearly 400 persons online. Many thanks from all over the world, uh, Australia, China, Europe, uh, so that's amazing. Many thanks also to all those of you who have decided to attend in person. Please note that the symposium is filmed and recorded and displayed online on the YouTube channel of Misha, as I have just mentioned. Videos will be available from the Misha website and from the Dissect EIC. I would like to add that the, we got funded by Ghent University, the Dissect EIC team, Nelle will say a few words on that, my research laboratory SAGE, and the Strasbourg Research Initiative in Sustainability and the Environment, FERED. Many thanks to our institutions for their support. I also wish to thank Céline, Latifa, Melis, and Natalia for their help during the day. All my gratitude to Camille and Sylvain who are behind the cameras uh, and behind the computers today for us. Let us turn to the, the innovative topic we have decided to cover. As you all know, the last 10 years have seen an increasing number of climate cases for which human rights courts have the possibility to play a big role in order not to leave climate change victims without redress. The European Court of Human Rights is facing its first climate litigation applications and will hold its first public hearing on the 29th of March. For sure, it's not the first time that human rights courts need to consider scientific facts. And the European Court of Human Rights, like all the human rights courts, have been in charge of dealing with environmental cases for at least four decades. From my previous publications, I have noticed notably after analyzing Article 8 environmental judgments that scientific causality often represents a blind spot in the court's reasoning or is considered with a certain degree of flexibility and or as one factor among others in an overall assessment of a case what Kathleen Suljok, who is with us uh, on Zoom today, has clearly revealed in her wonderful book. The other aspect I would like to mention is the fact that supranational courts on such sensitive and complex issues very much look at the way domestic courts have used scientific facts. And here we have seen many instructive but at the same time, many diverse uses of science. 
What is no more controversial is that European and other regional human rights courts, which are general courts, are not necessarily well equipped to deal with complicated scientific knowledge. The first category of questions which we probably need to address today is as follows. Are there any peculiarities regarding climate science? What I have in mind, is there any difference between environmental science and climate science, which is of any relevance to human rights tribunals? Is it because climate science is a lot about attribution so that it speaks to experts in law? Actually, there exists a need for courts to trace back climate change and specific harm to state conducts. Climate science has rapidly progressed in the understanding of attribution so that science can inform causation and also be useful when we come to decide about damages. Which comes to another issue. What sort of science do human rights courts need? Or maybe there is no such specificity but climate cases are different because they engage many defendant states at the same time. Hundreds or even millions of victims in the same case are about future generations, collective rights and duties, concepts which are foreign to the interpretation given so far to the European Convention of Human Rights. So climate change implies a change of scale. The second category of questions probably emerges from the concept of translating, which is in the title of our symposium today. Why would climate science need to be translated, mediated to magistrates? Is it the responsibility of climate scientists to do that? Who are the intermediaries, if we need any? Scientists in charge of fundamental research and judges need to keep their independence and st stay in separate spheres. Yet, climate science is needed for policymakers and the judicial sector. Do climate cases offer the opportunity for human rights tribunals to reassess the way they address causality and science? It is also obvious that as climate science forces public authorities to take a stand and that it is disruptive in reaction, it has therefore given rise to, to the emergence of false science. How should human rights courts make the distinction between relevant and less relevant science? Should the research unit, for instance, at the Strasbourg court be consolidated? At the same time, from a legal theory perspective, some argue that scientific truth, if it happens to exist, and legal truth do not necessarily match. The primary purpose of law is about justice, not about truth, as stated by our Swiss colleague Alain Papot. Drokin supported the opinion of an autonomous legal reasoning and I'm quite sure that many judges sitting at human rights courts would support that view. Moreover, climate cases are not only about scientific knowledge, but more broadly about political and ethical choices to be made democratically. There now exists a consensus as to the fact that most of climate warming is due to human activities and so science has informed us about the state's substantial contribution to climate change. Uh, in environmental cases, I also notice the importance given by the court to measures taken or delayed by states to respond to the risk of violations. So I cannot imagine why human rights courts would not be able to decide on European states' responsibilities for the negative impact of climate change. As is usually the case, complexity lies in the details and it might be challenging 
First, to determine the respective share attributable to climate change and to other factors, if there are any. Second, to allocate responsibility between state and non-state actors. And third, between states themselves, since climate change is essentially a global problem. As you see, this symposium should cover very important issues. And it offers a great opportunity for experts in law and experts in climate science to discuss together around the same table. So the program is structured around two panels. We have deliberately put scientists and lawyers together. The first panel will be about how to better connect what seems to be so far disconnected, scientific evidence and litigation strategies. The second panel will concentrate more on the remaining challenges and think about solutions to evidentiary hurdles in climate cases. Um, so I'm more than excited to listen to you on those aspects and probably on many more. I do hope that this symposium offers us a great opportunity to exchange and make emerge brilliant ideas. And I'm happy to give the floor to Nele for more introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, in view of the time, my German nature is a bit alerted because we do want enough time for all these wonderful speakers. Um, but I will take a few uh, moments to also address you. Um, esteemed colleagues and friends, first and foremost, my heartfelt thanks also goes out to Elizabeth, without whom this event truly would not have happened. Thank you so much for being a fantastic host, welcom welcoming us here at Misha. I'm absolutely delighted to extend my greetings to everyone present here from all parts of the world, both in person and also online, joining us as speakers and as attendees. What was envisioned as a relatively small event has gathered quite a bit of attention, and I think it only goes to show that this topic truly hits a nerve in our current climate, and this is without pun intended. To name but a fraction of cases with an advisory opinion on climate change sought from the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, a final draft resolution formulating a request for an advisory opinion before the ICJ having been uploaded a mere 10 days ago, and indeed the Strasbourg court entering their first set of hearings on climate cases at the end of the month, the broad interest in our symposium should not really surprise me, because climate science and the potential use in it for climate litigation is relevant to all of these initiatives. Our ambitions for this event remain humble and shall be clearly stated. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel today. Instead, we wish to pick up on a twofold aim. One is to share insights and knowledge on some of the most up-to-date climate science. And two is to open up or continue a dialogue amongst professionals from both the science and the legal disciplines on how climate science could be translated and used in the human rights courtroom. As an academic, I've been curious about science and climate litigation since starting my PhD in 2020, which, by the way, was also one of the hottest years ever on record. I'm affiliated to the European Research Council's dissect project led by Professor Marie Benedict Dambour, whose research group com comprehensively maps evidentiary regimes of the three regional human rights bodies, as well as the UN human rights quasi judicial bodies. This work is guided by the idea, and here I quote Marie, that evidence is at the heart of adjudication and adju adjudication at the heart of the international protection of human rights. Within this group, I've carved out my niche of researching the challenges arising from the introduction of complex scientific evidence in environmental and indeed climate contexts before two human rights courts, the Inter-American and the European Court of Human Rights. <coughs> my research has led me to consider the court's role in fact-finding and truth-seeking, something that Elizabeth has also spoken on, and I'm very curious to continue this discussion today, perhaps. I've studied burdens and standards of proofs in various environmental and climate cases and it has brought me to the Strasbourg court last summer, conducting interviews and engaging in conversations with various members of the court to better understand how legal personnel indeed approaches scientific evidence in a number of cases. 
Now, science and law is clearly not a novel topic altogether. The Strasbourg Court, which self-identifies, and I've heard this on numerous occasions, as a generalist court, has handled complex topics ranging from interstate conflicts, finance, medical negligence, torture, IVF, euthanasia, dig digital technology, and of course this list goes on. This point, I think, should be emphatically stressed. The court is capable of and has dealt with specialized expertise for decades. And yet, climate cases pose particular challenges, and I hope that some of these challenges will be addressed in our conversations today. The questions I am particularly curious about relate to how and to what extent can we expect courts to engage with, properly weigh, and assess complex scientific evidence? What are the specific challenges in the climate context? And what are the benefits and potential drawbacks if courts choose to refrain from making use of the available science? Whilst I will, I will leave it up to our fantastic speakers today to discuss the relevance of novel climate science and approaches for translating such climate science for the courtroom, I would like to take a few minutes to dive deeper into the theoretical underpinnings of weighing the pros and cons for considering scientific evidence in the first place. So why then should we deem the, import, uh, the incorporation of climate science as important? Now, I would argue that legal epistemology plays an important role in understanding the importance of properly incorporating science into judgments. Gardiner, for example, explains that legal epistemology provides us with an understanding of how knowledge, justification and explanation form the basis of a claim and how collective beliefs are formed by judges and juries. In the context of a judgment, epistemological considerations require an analysis of the judge's methodology when reaching a conclusion based on factual evidence. Sheila Jasanoff, whose pioneering work in science and technology studies deals extensively with how the law impacts the way we view evidence and proof, explains that neither law nor science traditionally seek to intensely scrutinize knowledge claims asserted by the other discipline. In her eyes, this hands-off approach, though, is challenged in the tr climate change, uh, sorry, climate litigation context. Climate litigation, she asserts, and I quote, increasingly requires a closer interaction and confrontation between the two fields, as judges are faced with the difficult task of having to assess complex, oftentimes novel or not so novel, but relatively unknown scientific evidence. So Jörg, whom we are also lucky to have as chair today, has also discussed the importance of adequate incorporation of scientific evidence in the environmental law context. She raises the risk of producing so-called Solomonic judgments, whereby common sense is used without <coughs> properly considering the available scientific evidence. This, in turn, could call into question the court's ability to handle technical cases and impact the court's overall authority. In practice, this means that when judges are called to determine whether states have adequately implemented environmental policies capable of upholding the fundamental and human rights of its citizens, they must base these considerations on sound science. In other words, a legal claim which has its epistemic foundations, namely assertions resting on the science, can hardly be dealt with without incorporating, at least to some extent, such scientific evidence. So why exactly might judges be hesitant in engaging too far with scientific evidence? For one, we of course cannot expect judges to magically turn into scientific experts, nor would we want them to. One specific risk is that scientific evidence may be incorporated incorrectly, leading to false conclusions and thus epistemic arbitrariness. Despermont and Mbenge in this regard have explained that, and I quote, methods of science and methods of law are not interchangeable or mutually supportive in every case. So, testing scientific claims based on legal methods could gravely distort the knowledge claims validity or meaning. To provide a practical example where courts truly quite struggled to combine flawless legal reasoning with climate science was in the otherwise hailed for various reasons groundbreaking case of agenda against the Netherlands. As pointed out by Meyer and indeed other scholars and scientists, the court relied on outdated calculations for mitigation targets from 2007, which gave them the increasingly difficult task of combating the climate crisis and reaching ambitious targets. In Meyer's words, may um, have become significantly more expensive in 2016. Now, what we hope to discuss today is some of the novel climate, climate science that has, come, uh, that has become especially relevant in aiding courts task for adjudicating on intersecting questions of science and the law. And so to come back to the aspirations for this symposium, we hope today to strengthen the bridges between the different disciplines and to ignite a much needed dialogue as to how we can com collectively combine our strengths 
our expertise, our wisdom and imagination to adequately respond to the planetary crisis we're facing. With policymakers having largely failed us, and at most having responded to climate change in a far too slow a manner, it is obvious that courts play a crucial role as separate arms of power to scrutinize whether governments continue to act on violations of their duties under various obligations, including, of course, human rights obligations. Adequate use of climate science, particularly novel findings from attribution science, for example, which we will hear about later on today, might aid in overcoming various procedural, substantive, and doctrinal hurdles, indeed, in it for the court's analysis. So with this, I will lead over to our fantastic uh, panel. Let me introduce the chairs. We have Katalin Suyok online joining us and Christian Bonin in person here with us today. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nele. Thank you very much, Elizabeth and Nele, for putting this on, for organizing this, and for having me as the first chair this morning. I will be short. My name is Christian Bona. I'm professor for history of science. Why am I here? I'm co-directing a master on health, environment, and politics. And I have worked on health sciences in the courtroom for over 20 years. So Sheila Jasanov was clearly one of the key points that I started with a long time ago. Um, science at the bar, science in the courtroom, um, regulatory science, science made for the courtroom. I think all these are questions that we're addressing all throughout the day. Um, <clears throat> just an alert to speakers, you have 30 minutes. S that's it. So either you use the 30 minutes and there's no immediate discussion or you are shorter and there can be a discussion up to 30 minutes. There is a final discussion of the morning and I do not have Swiss origins, but I have a Swiss clock. Um, so it will be 30 minutes, I warn you. Um, thank you for being with us, and I have the pleasure immediately to introduce our first speaker. Um, so we'll move from science. Pascal Birx is full professor at Ghent University and head of the Isotope Bioscience Laboratory. He holds a PhD in Applied Biology and Biological Sciences. His key interests are in biogeochemistry, climate change, ecosystem functioning, and integrated soil fertility management. He has worked internationally in Argentina, Chile, Cuba, Ethiopia, Kenya, etc. He has been a member of the International Thematic Network, CAFINAT, and he has worked at the African, on the African Great Lakes. Um, so what do you want to propose for us for relieving pressure on socio-ecological systems in the Congo and climate change to enter this morning? Okay. The floor Thank is yours. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the introduction. And uh, indeed, so I will talk about safeguarding um, nature-based solutions for, for CO2 mitigation, and I will focus on, on, on Central Africa. Um, well, since I'm the first one to speak, I, I, I put in a couple of introductory slides. Yeah? So this is just a, a signal of, of climate warming, starting in the, at the end of the 19th century until most recently. I will not go into detail because of the time, but you can clearly see, see the colors, yeah? that our, our planet has been, has been warming. Yeah? So this is the, the temperature anomaly above the 1961-1990 average, yeah? Red being warmer, blue being, 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 being colder. Um, so just a couple, of, a couple of numbers that I think you should know, yeah? So each year we currently produce 50 gigatons of CO2 per year, yeah? A giga, a giga is, a, is, is a billion, yeah? Um, so where do those emissions come from, yeah? In, in 2022, so 37 gigatons is CO2, four comes from land use change, that is mainly deforestation, and then nine is, is non-CO2 greenhouse gases, that's methane and nitrous oxide. Just to put that in perspective, yeah, in 1960 the world was producing 10, 10 times less, only five gigatons of CO2. And then the things which are pointed in, in red here on this slide is a little bit the focus of my presentation. So if we, if we look at sub-Saharan Africa, yeah, so that's the part of Africa be below the Sahara, it's only responsible for one gigaton of CO2. Yeah? That's 2% of this, of this 50, 50 gigaton. Yeah? Um, where does it come from? Well, it's mainly an energy problem. 75% yeah? comes from energy production. 18%, and I will talk about that as well as the acronym is AFOLU, that's 
agriculture, forestry, forests and land use change. Yeah? So that's a food production issue in essence. Yeah? So that's 18%. And then the remaining part is a waste and cement, so construction issue. Yeah? Um, well, net zero emissions, if we, if we want to achieve that, yeah, to stay below one degree Celsius, that has to be reached in 2050. That's not my projection, but that's from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Yeah? If we have another target, staying below 2.2, these net zero emissions have to be reached in 2100. Yeah? So that depends on the targets that you set. Well, how we do that? Um, we have to reduce fossil fuel combustion, that is clear, but we also have to enhance energy efficiency. Yeah? And, and that's a personal choice. I, I looked to my gas account yesterday. Yeah? I managed to reduce 30% gas consumption in my house only. So it's not so, it's not so complicated. 30% reduction. Yeah? 30%. Um, anyway, um, and then CO2 removals. Yeah? That's CO2 capture and storage, uh, geologically, technologi technological, but also nature-based solutions. Yeah? These are the forests that take up CO2, and I will talk about that. And then finally, um, climate solutions is a mix of, of, of measures that need to be taken. Yeah? There are engineering and nature-based technologies, yeah? but it's also about markets. It's also about social policy, and I will dive a little bit into that. And it's also about new financial instruments. Yeah? So it's not about only about technology. And then... Um, just to, to, to show you, is, is CO2 anthropogenically produced? Yeah? Um, well, there are a couple of signals for that. The black line that you see over here, yeah? that is the evolution of the CO2 concentration over the last 1,000 years. Yeah? We are now at 417 ppm. We come from about 218. Yeah? But there is another signal, eh? another signal that is never shown, yeah? but that's the isotopic signal. I will not go into the details. The isotopic signal of, of CO2. Yeah? And that is this blue line, yeah? And that is also, this black curve is known as the hockey curve, yeah? This isotopic signal, if you want, is an inverse hockey curve, yeah? And that's because these fossil fuels that we combust, combust, they have a specific isotopic signature, yeah? And that we can trace back in the isotopic signature of, 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 of CO2. Okay, quickly here. Total warming, at the moment, about 1.1 degrees Celsius, yeah? That's the same here. Where does it come from? The total is 1.1. If we look at the greenhouse gases alone, yeah? Warming would have been 1.5. But we also have cooling factors, and these are aerosols that we produce. Fine particles in the atmosphere, PM5, PM10, yeah? But they reflect solar radiation, so they cool, yeah? Climatologically, this might be a positive signal, yeah? but these fine particles have other negative aspects for, for health, for instance. Yeah? There is no significant effect of natural variation, like the solar radiation or volcanic eruptions, and there is no effect on the internal variation. Okay. I'm not going to explain this. Yeah? So there is, has been a perturbation of the global carbon cycle. Yeah? And you see here the arrows so this is the fossil fuel that has been combusted, yeah? And this is the amount of CO2, again, in gigatons that is stored into the atmosphere. And now I want to point you to one important thing, yeah? And that is this curve here. That is called the airborne CO2 fraction. That is the ratio of CO2 that is entering in the atmosphere divided by the amount that is emitted, yeah? So for the last year, this is 19 divided by 35. 35 coming from the fossil fuels, 19 gigatons of CO2 entering in the atmosphere. Yeah? And this is the evolution of that over the last 50 to 60 years. Yeah? There is some variation in it, but this remained fairly constant at about 45 to 50 percent. Yeah? So roughly half of the fossil CO2 that we produce <coughs> is entering into the atmosphere, despite that over the last 60 years, we increase the CO2 emissions from 5 to 50, yeah? So this is remarkable. And this is thanks to this, yeah? So this is a global map of nature-based CO2 sinks, yeah? 
En de more green the color is, the higher the capacity of, for instance, this is the Congo Basin, I will talk about the Congo Basin, the higher the capacity of these forests to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Yeah? So this is a natural buffer. So that this airborne CO2 fraction is staying constant. Yeah? Also, the oceans are taking up CO2. Yeah? This is a purely physical process. Now, currently, all the forests of the entire world, yeah, they remove about 15% of the total greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah? And this is about 7.6 gigatons. Yeah? So you have 50 that is produced. 7.6 is taken away by forests alone. Yeah? But these forests are an important buffer, but they will not solve our climate problem. Yeah? They will not solve it. Because this is going to level off. Yeah? And the cumulative CO2 uptake by forests in 2010 will, will peak about 20, in about 2060. Yeah? At a total, so a cumulative CO2 uptake between 100 and 220 gigatons. Yeah? Remember, we produce 50 every year. Yeah? The cumulative sink of these forests will be maximum 220. Yeah? So the solution is not there, but they still remain an important buffer. And then shortly about CO2 taken up by the oceans, this is, this is detrimental, yeah? because it's acidifying the oceans and it's causing the dissolution of calcium carbonate, which is bad for the corals. Yeah? Just to be very brief on this. OK, um, look, looking about these forests, this can be all positive. yeah. But this map, yeah, and I orient you a little bit, we are in the central Congo basin. Now, this is here Kinshasa, the capital of Congo. This is Kisangani towards the, towards the, the, the east. Now, what you see here is, again, a cumulative deforestation map over the last 20 years. Yeah? So everything that has, is red has been deforested. Yeah? So it is not a green patch, as you, as you might think. So there is a lot of perturbation going on. In that in that system, and that is this what is this map showing based on based on satellite images? Yeah. So what I would like now to talk about, trying to stay within the time, yeah, is the role of these nature-based solutions, yeah, and link that to to the social ecology. Why linking that to the social ecology? Because these people, yeah, that is driving this deforestation, they literally live from the forest. Yeah, they live from the forest, and I would like to tackle three aspects conservation of forest, restoration of degrading forests, and then intensification of agricultural production and how these trees are, are, are linked. Yeah? So just for, for you who do not know, nature-based solutions, and I read it here, are actions um, where people work with nature, including this conservation, restoration, and management to provide local benefits, food production, for instance, for the people, but also benefits of a more general nature, which is biodiversity, conversation and climate change mitigation. Um, I'll dive a little bit in, in what we are doing now. Yeah? So I mentioned these forests in Central Africa are a sink for CO2. Yeah? But we have really problems to quantify it. And this is just, a, I will not discuss these maps, but what you see here is on the y-axis, the CO2 uptake. And this in blue here is what we measure. Yeah? But we cannot measure, and these are these black, black dots here on all these maps. We cannot measure at every single location. Yeah? In the end, to upscale, we need models yeah? to have that for the 4 million hectare that the Congo Basin is. Yeah? But you see, there is a difference with what we model with the current existing models and what we measure. Yeah? So these models do not work yeah? for Central Africa. A reason is that they have been developed mainly for the Amazon, yeah? and they are apparently wrongly parameterized yeah? for these forests in Central Africa. So this is an issue. What we measure is not matching with what we model. So we have difficulties to make predictions at a la larger scale and into the future. Yeah? For that, we have an instrument. And I run such an inst instrument. I will not go into detail. I will just would like to show you the picture. It's an edicovariance flux tower. Yeah? It allows us to measure the net CO2 exchange yeah, between the forest and the atmosphere. We call that net ecosystem exchange. Yeah? So that is high level instrumentation to measure on a half hourly basis how much CO2 is taken up by the forest 
and how much CO2 is released by the forest. Yeah? And this is a little bit um, an, a, clo a closer picture. Yeah? And the heart of this is all the instrumentation which is on, on, top, on top of the forest, which allows us to do that. Yeah? It's unique. There are a couple of these, of these uh, systems worldwide. These are the only ones which you see on this map in, in tropical forests. And this map is just to show this is the only one which is actually running in, 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 in Central Africa, which is the second largest tropical forest block in the world after the Amazon. Yeah? And then we get this. Yeah? I, will, I will not explain to you. Yeah? It's, just <laughs> <laughs> it's just to show you that there is a huge variability and a huge complexity of the data that come out. Yeah? If it here, if it is negative, yeah, it's like a COVID test. There's a positive signal. Yeah? Then the CO2 is taken up by the forest. If it is positive, it is released into the atmosphere. But you see here some peaks yeah, that the forest is releasing CO2. This is a question mark, what is happening there. Yeah? Now, um, that's how we try to understand yeah, by measurements on the field, how much CO2 such a tropical forest is taken up every day on a per hectare basis. Yeah? Now, we also want to look into the future. Yeah? And again, what I, with this figure is showing, yeah, that models predict yeah, that the biome, yeah, so these forests in Central Africa, you look to the arrows here, yeah, that they will become hotter. That is what the figure on the left is indicating. Yeah. These figures on the right here, they indicate that these forests will become wetter. But then the question is, is this now positive? A wet forest is positive because we need a lot of water to sustain a tropical rainforest. But if it becomes hotter, it's not necessarily a good thing yeah, to keep these forests functioning. And then look at this. We have also been reconstructing yeah, um, temperature or historical climate data between 1960 and 2020. Yeah? And then you see the number of days, and we define a hot day, a day which is at a temperature higher than 32 degrees Celsius. That has to link linked with the physiology of the trees. Yeah? This has been increased between 1960 and 2020 from 30 days per year to 100 days per year. Yeah? On average, we measure a temperature increase of only 1 degree Celsius. Then you say, oh, 1 degree Celsius, will this impact the functioning of these, of these, of these forests? Likely not, but it is this, yeah, the number of hot days that increase from 30 to 100. Also the rainfall days, yeah, the rainfall remained constant, one, 1,800 millimeters per year. Then you say, ah, nothing is happening with the precipitation, yeah, it is just the same the last 60 years. But then you look, the number of rainfall days decreased from 130 to 110, but the same amount of rainfall is falling, that means the rainfall events become more intense, yeah? And the water is running off straight into the river and the trees don't have the time to take it up, yeah? Now, um, what is the trouble with, with, with deforestation in, in Africa, yeah? So it's completely different than in the Amazon and in Indonesia, yeah? Um, the main driver, and 85% of the forest disturbance is caused by what is called shifting or slash and burn agriculture yeah so this and then you see a landscape like here on the right yeah so these are smallholder farmers that cut the forest forest burn it down produce crops for one of one or three years bring it into a fallow system and progressively move into into the forest yeah that is the food production of the majority of the people in central africa yeah if you then look to this figure here yeah these are the population projections, yeah? And you see here Africa, how it is growing, yeah? At the moment, roughly 17% of the global population lives in Africa, yeah? If these projections are correct, yeah? Then by 2100, 40% will live in Africa, yeah? And with this way of food production, and also they produce charcoal, yeah? This way of energy and food production is fully unsustainable, yeah? fully unsustainable to support this growing population. And this is the driver for deforestation. Yeah? 
Anyway, this, in the view of the time, <coughs> this presentation will become available. Yeah, there are some details here. Yeah. So tropical deforestation, the driver for tropical deforestation is agriculture. Yeah. And it's completely different if you compare the Amazon with Africa. Yeah. So the Amazon is mainly driven by international commodities, yeah, like soya. Yeah. In Africa, it is driven for 90% by local commodities. So that is food that is produced to sustain local livelihoods. Maize, cassava, etc., etc. Yeah. Only 10% is export commodities like cocoa and, and, and coffee. That is the case, and that is what is on this slide. Yeah. And then you see a picture like this. Yeah. That is how a local farmer is trying to grow maize, yeah? with a yield of one ton per hectare. While in Europe, we can easily get 10 to 15 tons per hectare. So that's a factor of 10. Yeah? Um, how I'm doing with the time? We have 10 minutes. OK, good. That, is, that, that, that will be good. Um, so. Planting trees and, and, and the trouble with, with, with planting trees. Yeah? So there is the bond challenge. Yeah? The bond challenge aims at restoring forest landscapes. Yeah? And they want to restore 3.5 million square kilometers. Yeah? Just to give you an idea how big that is, that is 40% so half of Australia. Yeah? Okay. And the thing is, they you, it's a technical term, they call it afforestation. Yeah? That means establishing forests on lands that was, was previously not a forest. Yeah? So reforestation is regrowing forest where forest was before. Afforestation is on land where forest was not before. Yeah? And then the idea is to plant also trees in, in savanna landscapes, like the Serengeti and the Kruger National Park. You all know them. But this climate is not suitable to grow trees. There is simply not enough water. Yeah? So this will not work. Also, to achieve yeah, net zero emissions only with growing trees, you would need between 38 and 127 million square kilometers. Yeah? This is unrealistic, yeah? just to put a couple of numbers. And then, and then I come a little bit, and that's debatable. Yeah? So if you would reforest, reforest or afforest these 3.5 million square kilometers, yeah? This would cost about $1,000 billion. Yeah? Is this a lot? Well, I put here the likely profit of a couple of these big oil companies for 2023. That's estimated, if I read the documents, at 200 billion euros. Yeah? And then a last point is, is a CO2 tax of $80 per ton CO2 defendable? With the question mark. Well. If I do a simple multiplication of the 12 gigaton of CO2 that comes from oil, I arrived at this 1,000 billion dollars per year. Yeah. <coughs> so the m anyway, I'm not a specialist in, in CO2 taxation, but but you can do a simple couple of simple calculations, yeah, to justify that this 1,000 billion billion dollars is not unreachable. Huh? Okay. Now. Instead of planting trees at areas where they are, and this is then also called, I put it here, phantom forests. Yeah? So these are areas where trees have been planted and they simply do not grow. Yeah? So these are investments. You plant the trees and they don't grow. So regrowth yeah, is, is what we think yeah? a, better, a better option. Yeah? And that's what you see here. Yeah? Um, I'll put maybe everything on the slide. Uh, so what is now happening if a forest starts to regrow? So that's according to sch this scheme. So you have a forest. It is burned down by the local farmer for subsistence agriculture. And then it starts to regrow. Yeah? Without going into the detail, we have, we have some, some experiments on that. And I'll start on the right-hand side. So these are forests of different ages here. Yeah? Going from a young forest of five years to the old growth forest. Yeah? And then you see, this is the tree species richness. After 60 years, the tree species richness is exactly the same as in the old growth forest. So this is positive news. These are different species, so the composition is different. Yeah? But if you then look on the left side, <coughs> these are the carbon stocks. Yeah? So the CO2 that is present in these forests. 
Again, we start from a young forest of five years, and here on the right is the, is the pristine forest, yeah? This is the forest of 60 years, yeah? So we see after 60 years, we recover only 45% of the original carbon content, yeah? So this is less positive news, yeah? Here in the middle is the above ground carbon gain. That's how much CO2 is taken up by these forests every year and per hectare, yeah? And you see here that if you have a young forest or an old forest, that this does not really matter. So, and this is the number, yeah? 1.8 tons of carbon per hectare per year, yeah? You can convert carbon to CO2, eh? you divide by 12 and you multiply by 44. That's what you do, and then you convert it to, to, to CO2, yeah? So, that is what's happening now if you would like to restore, yeah, these uh, degraded forests, yeah? But that's that's easily said, yeah? Because you have to give something in return, yeah? So these farmers, and then I come to the last point, this is agricultural intensification, yeah? As an ecologist or whatsoever, going there, we have to preserve the intact forest. You have to restore the degraded forests. And then I come to this socio-ecological nexus where this local population is living from the forest because that's their, that's their natural capital, yeah? You have to invest in um, a sustainable intensification of um, food production. Yeah? And this is something I don't have the time in, 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 in detail. We did, we did, together with the African Wildlife Foundation, we did a big experiment really in, in, in the heart of the Congo Basin. It was a very simple intervention. Yeah? So we gave the farmers improved varieties. Yeah? And what you see here in light gray is, is where the improved and varieties were given in dark gray, they did not receive it, yeah? So this is the degree of adaptation. So they adopt these simple agronomic technologies because the bar is higher here, yeah? And then we were going to assess if this improved agricultural activity has an effect on the deforestation, yeah? So uh, dark gray is without intervention of agricultural intensification, light gray is with, yeah? You see the numbers are still positive, there is still deforestation, but it decreased, yeah? So if you bring in some simple agricultural activities, the deforestation rate was decreasing. There is still deforestation because I have positive numbers here, but relatively it decreased if you don't do an agricultural intervention, yeah? And this is my last slide, yeah? Um, this is a quote from Deborah Levy, a South African writer, yeah? So what I, what I, is, is actually also my, my conclusion, yeah? So if you have a socio-ecological mismatch, yeah? Which I try to explain, which is happening now for Central Africa with this slash and burn agriculture, yeah? This leads to an environmental degradation, yeah? Which is the huge, defore, no huge, which is the deforestation, which is, which is, which is ongoing, yeah? And then I would like to end with this quote from her, yeah? The world is our real estate and we are just temporary tenants. So, and we should take care of it. And this is just an example of, of the research we are trying to do in, in, in Central Africa to conserve and restore forests, but at the same time have a lot of attention for sustainable agricultural intensification to have food security ready for the people who live from the forest. And these are my details for those who want to contact me or not so ever. And I hope that I stick within the time. Perfect. <laughs> You've written, done, presented. Thank you very much, Pascal. Um, <clears throat> a not very um, enthusiastic entry into our subject, but I think a realistic analysis. Um, what strikes me evidently is the fact that there there's no ecology without the social, yeah. um, visibly, and that's definitely something I would take from the health sector to the environmental sector. Yeah. Um, maybe one question from the floor, because it's always really frustrating to present something. We have one minute. Anybody who wants to raise a question to Pascal at this point before the later discussion, yes, please push the button. I just have a very basic question about the Great Green Wall in the Sahelian region. So yes. is it afforestation or reforestation? That is an afforestation project. Okay. Yeah. 
So it's not that useful according to you, like your research. Well, I would, I would, I, I, I'm not 100% confident with with the the great green wall. Yeah, um, it it this well, it it has other benefits. Yeah? This is something I did not dive into. If if you if you restore a forest, yeah, and and if it starts to grow, you have. If you put that within the climate change context, we call it then co-benefits. Yeah, a, and and this is is water harvesting, for instance biodiversity uh, preservation, non-timber wood, wood products, yeah. Um, the Great Green Wall can, can, be, can be good in, in stopping the prog progression of the, of, the, of the Sahara, yeah. So it has, without knowing the details, likely other, o other benefits, but that, what they are doing there, will not solve our, our CO2 problem, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, the further questions were open to discussion, so note, note them down, take them, and we, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the morning we'll come back to. We will now move. Thank you very much, Pascal, once again. Um, <laughs> great presentation and a lot of data and information that clearly is needed. Um, we now move out into the World Wide Web with the presentation by uh, Helen Keller. Um, welcome, Helen. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay, and we can hear you perfectly well as well. Helen Keller has been a full-time judge at the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg from 2011 to 2020. Um, she has been awarded an honorary doctorate by the University of Freiburg in 2018 for her contribution to cross-fertilization of doctrine and practice. In 2020, she was awarded a recognition prize for the Foundation of Western Ethics and Herzegovina Ethics and Culture, and since 2020, she serves as a judge at the Constitutional Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, so thank you very much for being with us this morning, um, Helen. Um, we move from science to the courtroom, to the judges. Um, I think the floor is yours immediately. Um, it's up to you. Thank you so much. I, if you give me the allowance, I try to share my screen. You, you have it normally. Helen, can you try to share your, sc your screen? Yes, it's working. Perfect. Very good. You see my title, Experts and Judges. This is not a dream team. It's rather a mesalliance. And why this is? I only can speculate, but before I do that, just give me uh, a moment and I'll try to give you an overview about what I want to present. I go first in the introduction to speak what is the court or what I mean by that. Then I go to the big issue of admissibility because the scientific question always come after admissibility. Then on certain facts, usually we have scientific evidence on question of facts, not so much on questions of law. Then I present from my experience two examples uh, that I had and I come back once again, whether there is a possibility to have expertise on questions of law. I quickly go to the questions, are there good and bad experts? Who bears the costs for expertise? Then I try to give a, an example on expert language and how this, this has to be translated. And I will conclude and speak about this mesalliance. As I mentioned, there is a certain distrust between judges and experts. I don't know exactly why, but I'll come uh, back to that at the very end. When I speak of the court, I am referring to very specific people behind the scenes. In every procedure, the rapporteur plays a prominent role. For many procedural questions, he or she will make a request 
to the president, either of the chamber or the grand chamber. The president then formally takes the decision. Often he or she adopts the rapporteur's proposal without discussing. Only for very important procedural steps will the chamber or the grand chamber be convened. In addition to the rapporteur and the president, the registry also plays a central role as a grey eminence. Although the case lawyer does not decide, he or she will submit important questions and proposals to the rapporteur. These suggestions may include that the hearing of the parties or of experts or of witnesses could be ordered. These proposals may, of course, also come from the parties or from third party interveners. We all know the biggest hurdle at the European Court of Human Rights is admissibility. Over 90% of cases fail on this, very many on the criterion that the case is so-called MIF. This is the internal jargon for manifestly ill-founded. It needs no further explanation that it is only when a case has cleared this hurdle that it has reached a point where the inclusion of experts is possible. If a case is not declared inadmissible in the single judge procedure, most cases by now are communicated in the so-called IMC procedure. That means in the immediate simplified communication system. This is an important point that many outsiders underestimate. In the IMC procedure, the government is served with the case with a request to present the procedural history of the case and the facts. The government will do this to the best of their ability. This statement will then be submitted to the applicant for comment. It is important to understand that the facts apply as presented by the government if they are not disputed by the applicant. Because expert opinions often concern facts, not questions of law, it is eminently important to dispute the government's presentation of the facts already at this stage to submit one's own presentation of the facts to the court and, if necessary, to point out the issues in dispute and the possibility of an expert opinion. If the applicant fails to dispute the facts, the court will adopt the government's version of the facts. Allow me to make here a preliminary conclusion. As a rule, the court will not seek expert opinion to answer questions of law, in particular not human rights law questions. The clarification of legal questions is left to the court, but I'll come back to this when I present the two examples. When certain facts are disputed, the court has various ways of dealing with this uncertainty. In simpler cases, both factual variants are included in the judgment, and the court decides which variant it considers more convincing, sometimes applying certain rules of evidence or reversal of burden of proof. The reversal of burden of proof is typical in cases where the court has to judge the ill treatment of persons in state custody. Sometimes expert opinions obtained by the parties are simply attached to the case file. 
these expert opinions are read by the case lawyer. However, they are weighted as party opinions and not necessarily as objective opinions, with maybe one big exception, and these are medical certificates. Finally, it sometimes happens that the court asks the party to obtain an expert opinion. This is often the case when it comes to expropriations and the court needs an expert opinion to be able to determine the compensation for damage that the state should pay to the expropriated person. As a rule, the government will then demand that it may also have the value of the expropriated property estimated in a government ex expert opinion. More difficult are constellations where more complex issues require expertise. This is the case, for example, when new scientific questions arise. This happens often in the court's practice in Article 8 cases, when medical issues are at stake, such as access to reproductive or abortion techniques, or the authorization of medicines. Climate lawsuits currently pending before the Grand Chamber raise entirely new questions as well. I go to the two examples. In the first procedure, it is Parilla versus Italy from 2015. Essentially, this case dealt with ethically difficult questions of what may be done with surplus embryos that are not used in in vitro fertilization. May the state order that the embryos be kept indefinitely? Are the parents allowed to decide about the surplus embryos? What happens if they, among them, disagree? Can research be carried out on these embryos? These are difficult question and you may have guessed it the court was restrained in its judgment and gave the states a wide margin of discretion however it seems important to me that various organizations and experts submitted applications for third party interventions in these proceedings third party interventions offer a low threshold possibility to submit a certain expertise to the court. However, the effect of this expertise is also limited. The third party intervention is usually part of the dossier that the judges have to deal with in the case. But the third party intervention is summarized in the rapporteur's report or then in the judgment to one or two paragraphs. If one is unlucky, this expert opinion will have been read by the case lawyer and the rapporteur, but not by all the judges. A third party intervention receives much more attention if the request has been made that the third party intervener can also present orally during the hearing in the grand chamber. I would recommend this to every expert who has an important message. It is true that you then have to break down the expertise to a core about 10 minutes, but this has the advantage that all judges can listen and even ask questions. The second case, which required a lot of expert knowledge, was not an individual case, but an interstate case. I was involved in the case Georgia versus Russia number two from 2021, which essentially dealt with the question of whether Russia had violated human rights during the 
2008 war between Georgia and Russia and during the subsequent occupation. The difficulty in this case was that the factual situation was disputed by the two states. The court struggled with not being able to travel to the disputed territories of South Ossetia and Abkhazia. It was therefore not possible to have an on-site inspection or to question witnesses in those two territories. Instead, the court decided to hold an extensive hearing of witnesses and experts, those provided by the parties and those convened by the court. The expert opinions submitted by the parties were mainly of no help. Their independence was doubtful. Those experts invited by the court proprio motu, on the other hand, were, in my, my view, very helpful. On the one hand, they showed the limits of what the court can do at all in such proceedings. On the other hand, the court was able to clearly qualify certain claims of the parties as false on the basis of these expert opinions. It was certainly crucial that these experts were present, that they were questions in cross-examination of the parties' representatives, and that the judges could ask them questions. This very elaborated procedure demonstrates both the quality and the independence of those experts. But it makes also clear, the court has neither the time nor the resources to conduct such an elaborated procedure for all cases in which scientific issues are disputed. I come back here uh, to the question whether the court can ask expert opinions on questions of law. As a rule, I would say the court only seeks expert opinions on questions of fact. In this case, however, in Georgia versus Russia number two, the court asked the International Committee of the Red Cross for an opinion because the proceedings also involved questions of international humanitarian law. However, the ICRC refused to comment because it considered this incompatible with its neutral role in a war. So, exceptionally and theoretically, the court might also invite experts to give his or her opinion on a question of law, but this is the exception and concerns a specific field of law, certainly outside of human rights law. I come to the question, are there good or bad experts? Whether an expert T's corresponds to the state of science cannot be answered simply. Experts should be selected according to objective criteria. An affiliation with a renowned university or publications are an indication of that quality. To a certain extent, it is up to the parties to question the reliance of an expert if there is evidence to do so. However, we must not harbor any illusion. The court has no absolute guarantee that an expert is really up to date with the latest scientific knowledge, nor that he or she is truly independent. A remark on costs. Party expert opinions are paid for by the parties. If the court invites an expert, 
only the expenses are reimbursed. So the actual costs for the expert opinion are not reimbursed. To make it very clear, you do not get rich if you are invited by the court to provide an expertise. Expert language. I would like to use the example of the climate cases pending before the European Court of Human Rights to show that experts and scientists deal with the same or similar question, but they use different terms than lawyers do. It seems important to me that both the judges and the experts learn that they have to translate their own terms into the language of the other group. The different uses of language is one of the big obstacles to judges and experts not always understanding each other easily. Let's take the example of victim status in the Klimasanjorinen case against Switzerland. The central issue here is whether all the women are more affected than others by global warming during hot summers. In the terminology of scientists, this is about statistical excess mortality. These terms have to be transposed from one language to the other, and the lawyers would use the victim status and the vulnerability of a particular group. We can observe something similar if we go to the question whether Article 2 and 3 of the Convention are applicable ratione materia. Both articles require a certain intensity of the threat. For scientists, this raises the question of the occurrence of risk. With what probability do we have to assume that climate change poses an imminent threat to elderly ladies? For the court, on the other hand, this is a threshold requirement in the context of Article 2 and 3. I come to my last part. Not hate, not love, rather a mesalliance. Um, I come to the question of why judges are suspicious of experts. There are several reasons for this, and it, it goes without saying that I cannot answer the question for a specific judge, but only formulate my assumptions here in a general way. Not only since the COVID-19 pandemic, but increasingly since then, there has been a growing skepticism of science. Science is portrayed as arbitrary and sometimes even denigrated. This tendency also leaves its marks on the courts. The involvement of experts is often considered unnecessary because it prolongs, complicates and increases the cost of the procedure. Judges often feel overwhelmed by the expertise. The, these are sometimes extensive and difficult to understand. Judges often fear that the expertise makes the decision unnecessarily more difficult. They sometimes experience that they know even less what to decide are even more confused than before the expertise, but are now confused at a higher level. The responsibility in a court case ultimately lies with the judges. 
This means that the judges do not necessarily want to have even more information for the basis of the decision because they shy away from complexity. Thus, a certain blinker mentality of the judges towards the expert becomes apparent. I conclude. Expert opinions are used more frequently at the court than one might think. There are very different expert opinions, mainly those of the parties and those obtained by the court. The financial resources for expert opinions are very limited. This limits the choice of opinions from the outset. How favorable the court reacts to a request to submit an expert opinion depends not exclusively, but nevertheless to a quite large extent on the attitude of the rapporteur. The more favorable he or she reacts to such requests, the greater the chance that the expert opinion will be admitted to the court. Experts have various possibilities to get in touch with the court. Third party interventions is a low threshold opinion. Here the request comes directly from the expert. In this procedure, it is useful to request an oral, represent, an oral presentation during the hearing in addition to the written submission. This is the only way to get into an exchange with the judges. The expert can also contribute their expertise via the party's submission. However, a party submission is always read with a certain skepticism. Finally, in rare cases, the court invites experts itself. Because the resources for this are very limited, this rarely happens. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, maybe you can unshare your presentation so that the, thank you that everybody can see you again. <clears throat> Thanks for staying with time as well. We have a couple of minutes um, for a question or two from the room, from the floor to the judge. Any things you would like? Yes, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much for this very can enlightening presentation. Can you just present yourself yes. so Helen oh. knows who is talking? Apologies. Uh, my name is Stephanie and I'm a legal officer with the Global Legal Action Network who supports the young applicant in the Duarte Agostinho case pending before the Grain Chamber. Um, my question relates to Ellen Keller's last point regarding the likelihood of expert being appointed by the court. And I'm just curious to know Ellen's opinion uh, as to the likelihood of such experts to be relied upon by the court in climate cases, given the really novel and uh, new questions that are brought forward by the parties, and how important it would be for the judges, for instance, to have their own experts appointed in those cases. Thank you very much. I think there are in the room persons present that would be more able to speak on that. As far as I know, uh, in the proceedings pending before the court, quite a lot of experts have asked to um, be allowed to present a third party intervention. And at least in the climate, in the Klimaseniorinnen case, uh, some experts from the really scientific field are admitted, not all. Um, here we might come back to third party interventions. I told you it's a low threshold to get in, but one also has to say it is a little bit of a black hole whether the court allows a third party intervention or not. It is completely uh, in the power of the president to allow a third party intervention or not. And then 
I think very practical um, consideration come into play. If you have a grand chamber and you already have, you know, 15 third party interventions admitted and then comes a 16th, a 17th, at a certain point, you will just say it's enough because you have to deal with the dossier at the end of the day. So, you know, I would say try to get in, try to say it is really an important issue and try to say um, it is so important that it would be useful to present the main message during the oral hearing, but you have no guarantee, no right to do that. Thank you for a very clear response, I think, to a question that was um, not easy. Um, is there a second question from the floor or somewhere else? If not, once again, thank you very much, Helen, for the judicial um, court counterpart to the first scientific presentation. And we'll move on to our third speaker before the coffee break. <clears throat> Our third speaker should move up to the computer, please, Rupert. Um, while I introduce you, you can settle in. Um, Rupert Stewart-Smith is a research associate <coughs> in climate science and the law of the University of Oxford's sustainable law program. He presents research interests cover the use and interpretation of climate science evidence in litigation and methodological developments in climate change attribution science. His work also spans climate and glacier modeling, the impact of climate change on health and strategy development for climate litigation. Um, we will get the presentation set in a second. Thank you, Neela. And I think the screen is registered right away when it's played here. Fantastic. Um, thank you very much. And I have the wonderful task of turning us to some more detailed um, discussions of issues of science and also to do so um, immediately before the coffee break. So I shan't overstay my welcome. I, I wanted to start off by actually just getting a sense of who's in the room. So perhaps I could ask you to raise your hand if you are a lawyer or training to be a lawyer, perhaps. How about a scientist of some type or other? And if you've not raised your hand for either of those. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, and if you're online, then you're very welcome to raise your hand, but unfortunately I won't be able to see it. Um, and then perhaps when we talk about the issue of causation in climate change litigation in particular, we're talking about the relationship between greenhouse gas emissions and the manifestations of climate change that result in losses for claimants. And perhaps I could also have a show of hands in the room for whether or not you think it would be possible in principle in climate related lawsuits to establish a causal relationship in law between greenhouse gas emissions and their consequences. So if you think that would be possible, would you raise your hand? And if not, would you raise your hand now? <laughs> I think there have been a few abstentions. Why do you think it wouldn't be possible, if, I, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot? Um, I'm not sure at all, but 
I feel like it's super complicated to um, really show the causation because because it affects everyone, then how are you able to prove that it's going to affect the claimant in particular and that in particular he is or she is a victim? Fantastic. And I hope that over the next 20 minutes, my remarks will address perhaps some of those issues. Um, There may, of course, remain issues of law, but in principle, at least, as an issue of science, Science, I think, can clarify the facts of these sorts of cases. It can demonstrate the relationship that exists between greenhouse gas emissions and the consequences of climate change. And I really appreciated um, Professor Keller's remarks before. And I recognize the fact that science, so at least there may be a perception that science can sometimes complicate the facts. But I hope in the next few minutes, I can show how science can also clarify, how science can clarify at least the factual basis for the claims being made before the courts. And when I'm talking about climate science today, I'm going to particularly focus on a branch of this science known as attribution science. It's developed over the last two decades or so, and it describes a set of scientific methods that addresses these sorts of causation issues in climate litigation. Some years ago, you would have heard the media often report after some sort of extreme weather event had happened that it's not possible to quantify the contribution that climate change makes or that greenhouse gas emissions from human activity make to any one um, weather event. That is no longer true. We have scientific methods that allow us to answer these questions. We can demonstrate the contribution that climate change makes to a wide range of weather events be they heat waves, storms, droughts, floods, and also to rising sea levels and glacier retreat around the world. There may be some constraints in terms of the types, certain types of events are more difficult to look at. There are also, um, it is also the case that not everything is caused exclusively or even substantially by climate change. But where that is the case, often we can, at least in scientific terms, demonstrate those things. And these facts mean that scientific developments can, in principle, provide a factual basis for the types of causal claims being made in growing numbers of lawsuits brought around the world. Specifically, these claims I mentioned before, that greenhouse gas emissions of one entity contribute to another's losses, or indeed the risk of losses. And over the next few minutes, I'll expand a little bit on the science that allows us to resolve those questions develop insights there. But I'd like to start off with a case study from Peru. This is Laguna Palcococha in the Peruvian Andes, and behind it you see the Palcarahu Glacier. The photos were taken by the Austrian mountaineer um, and glaciologist Hans Kinzel in the 1930s. You see a medium-sized lake full to the brim, overflowing. And in 1941, a few years after those photos were taken, Laguna Palcacocha burst in what's called a glacial lake outburst flood, devastating parts of the city of Huaraz below it, killing at least 1,800 people. This photo showing large portions of the city still covered in debris and mud and silt was taken six years later. But over the last 70 years or so, The retreat of the Palcarahu Glacier has seen Laguna Palcacocha expand substantially. The lake is now substantially larger than it was after the 1941 flood. In fact, 34 times larger in volume than it was in the 1950s. And this is despite efforts over decades to lower the lake levels, to install siphons, to remove water from the lake. But nevertheless, the lake, as I say, is substantially larger than it was then, and it's considered to continue to present a serious danger to Raraz below it. And the role of climate change in this story um, has become, or has come under particular scrutiny due to the gentleman on the left in this image. Saul Luciano Luya um, brought a case before the courts in Germany arguing that under the uh, Article 1004 of the German Civil Code, 
he um, or RWE, a German energy company, should pay part of the costs of measures needed to protect the city in proportion to their historical contribution to climate change. And while the case was dismissed um, due to a range of factors, including difficulties in demonstrating the specific link between the emissions of one particular entity that you mentioned before and um, specific impacts of climate change manifesting in Peru in the first instance, on appeal, it's entered an evidentiary phase where two main scientific questions have emerged. The first being, is it indeed the case that the lake threatens the city? And the second, if so, is this climate change? Now, to give you an idea of the power of developments in climate science in resolving these sorts of questions, the sorts of evidence available to answer these questions when the case was first filed were those from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Reports. It's an authoritative body of evidence that is the, um, collects knowledge from across the scientific community and is directly accepted by governments. But the problem with IPCC evidence is it can be regional or global in scale, and in some cases, a result of this, and a result of the sort of negotiation process by which these consensus understandings of the science emerge, it can be relatively equivocal. So the sorts of statements that the case relied on in the first instance was that more than half, only more than half of the observed warming over the last 60 years was due to human influence on the climate. <laughs> We now know, in fact, that essentially all the observed change in temperature is a consequence of human influence in the climate. And in fact, that particular quote comes from the fifth assessment report of the IPCC. And the very next sentence says that the best estimate is pretty much all the observed warming is attributable. On the glacier retreat side of things, which has created this flood risk that exists today, the statements were similarly equivocal, talking about the fact that glaciers worldwide are retreating in part due to increases in local temperature levels. But what developments in science allow us to do and allow us to understand in these sorts of settings is just how much climate change is affecting this specific setting. And some research with colleagues of mine in Oxford and in Seattle, we found that human-induced warming was responsible for virtually all, certainly 95%, of the observed warming in the region around the glacier, and that the retreat of the glacier that led directly to this increase in flood risk was a direct consequence of that warming. It couldn't have happened due to natural variability alone, but moreover, our best estimate was essentially all the retreat of the glacier was attributable to this warming that in turn was a direct consequence of human activity. So this is the level of specificity which scientific methods allow us now to go into in understanding the role of climate change in a growing number of disasters or risks of disasters occurring around the world. And it's not only one study. In the last few years, studies like these have been conducted for a wide range of events around the world, both weather events, sea level rise, and other sorts of impacts of climate change. A substantial portion of these studies, all the red dots on the board behind me, um, found some role of climate change to a greater or lesser extent. And what we now have is an understanding of, for quite a number of events around the world, just to what extent climate change is playing a role. And the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was able to assimilate all of this evidence, which means that we now have regional understandings of how climate change is affecting different sorts of events we see that pretty much worldwide, heat waves are getting hotter due to climate change. And we know that on the basis of all of this evidence. For many regions, we have enough evidence to show that heavy rainfall events that lead to floods are also getting stronger. And in some regions, we're seeing increases in drought also. All of this attributable to human influence on the climate. So we have the ability to conduct these specific studies on the basis of that, and the basis of expert interpretation, we also have an understanding of the regional changes that are happening as a result of human influence in the climate. And this could have a very influential role in legal settings. We know that causation is a key issue in many climate lawsuits. And to establish factual causation, we need both this general understanding that greenhouse gas emissions cause climate change, 
that climate change causes impacts of the type suffered by claimants in these cases, but also the specific causal link between which may need to span the full causal chain from the greenhouse gas emissions of a specific defendant right the way through to the specific losses suffered by the claimant in question. The body of scientific evidence we have now allows us to generally resolve these general causation questions very robustly, and specific attribution studies also allow us to interrogate these specific causation claims. It's not the case that everything is caused by climate change, but we can interrogate the evidence in terms of whether or not the specific harms in question are. For some time now, legal scholars have recognized the role that this form of scientific evidence can play in evaluating causal claims, and they've championed the role that climate change attribution science may have in resolving the growing number of climate lawsuits for which the relationship between greenhouse gas emissions and their impacts comes into question. But how does this all work? Well, scientifically, and without getting into too greater detail at a high level, the questions that are asked are the following. If we want to understand the effect of climate change on extreme weather events, it's of course the case that these are not novel phenomena. phenomena. We've always had floods, we've always had droughts. What climate change does, and the question we can ask of these events is, how much worse were these events because of human-induced climate change? Or how much more frequently are they happening? We have climate models and we've got observations and the, combining them together allow us to basically simulate the world that would have existed in the absence of human-induced climate change. We can simulate that world using robust methods, as I say, robust methods that have been recognized by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And in so doing, we can quantify how an event of a certain type would have been different absent climate change. For slow onset trends, things like glacier retreat or rising sea levels, we can ask related questions. We can ask, could the observed changes, the retreat of this certain glacier or sea level rise in a particular location, could that have happened due to chance alone? Could that have happened just because of natural variability? We can also ask, rather than just, is this, does, does this require climate change to have happened? We can say, to what extent was climate change responsible for this? we can quantify the proportion, the proportional contributions of human and natural factors. And for glaciers, the studies that have been done around the world provides a compelling evidence that climate change is the primary driver, and particularly human-induced climate change is the primary driver of glacier retreats around the world. And that is also the case for sea level rise in the global mean, although it may vary slightly um, in certain regions where coasts may also be subsiding. So we have a powerful set of methods that allow us to quantify these facts, that allow us to understand the extent to which climate change is affecting these physical hazards that create losses. But this is about the role of climate change as a whole. Now, this quote comes from um, a US court and now about uh, 13 years ago or so. But um, in this one of the early climate litigation cases brought by a village called Kivalina um, in Alaska, which was forced to relocate due to coastal erosion. The court stated that it was not plausible to, to state which emissions, emitted by whom and at what place in the world, caused the plaintiff's alleged global warming-related injuries, and that this was due to the fact that there were so many contributors to climate change that were allegedly responsible for various the various chain of events allegedly leading to the erosion of Kivalina. In other words, in a world in which there are so many contributors to climate-related harms, is it possible really to pinpoint the contribution that any one entity makes? Now, unlike some other harms that happen outside the climate context, it's not the case that it is the molecules of carbon dioxide emitted by one country that causes one weather event and another country that causes another weather event, but rather, all emissions are combined in the atmosphere, collectively result in global warming, and global warming in turn leads to the manifestations of climate change around the world. So all contributors to climate change contribute in part to the impacts of climate change we see. But scientifically, it's now possible, in fact, to, to quantify 
the extent to which individual greenhouse gas emitters have contributed to harms. Legally, you may not always need this information. It may be sufficient to quantify the role that climate change plays as a whole and then allocate responsibility or, um, for contributions to harm based on some sort of market share approach or proportional approaches. But where it's necessary, scientifically, we can answer these questions. We can say to what extent are Shell's emissions or the emissions of the US responsible for certain extreme weather events, for sea level rise, for ocean warming and acidification. And we can do that both for events that have already happened and also for projections of changes that might happen in the future. There are studies that have done all of these things. We can quantify the contributions of countries or companies or even individuals, if need be. We can model the world as it would have been without Shell's emissions. We can model the world as it would have been without the emissions of Austria. So we have a set of methods that allow us to quantify the effects of climate change in a range of settings, or indeed individual contributors to climate change. But so far I've only spoken about physical manifestations of climate change. These, the strength of heat waves, the intensity of storms. What new developments in climate science also allow us to do is to extend these methods to the impacts of those events. It's now possible to synthesize methods from epidemiology and physiology to understand what are the health impacts of climate change. So we can quantify how many fewer deaths might have happened in a given summer in the absence of climate change. Or we can look at economic impacts or infrastructural damage resulting from these storms. And again, we can ask the question, in the absence of climate change, would these, would these losses have occurred? Or how much less bad would the losses have been? And what these developments allow us to do is to answer the question of, well, to evaluate that full causal chain I, spelt, uh, I described early on in the talk, right the way from the emissions of these individual entities, these individual contributors to climate change, and to demonstrate that those emissions may indeed contribute um, to losses suffered by, in the legal context, um, individual claimants. This particular figure on the bottom here um, shows um, heat related, the stacks on the bottom, these are heat related deaths um, occurring in the summer of 2018 in the canton of Zurich. And the darker red segments are all those heat related deaths attributable to climate change. The lighter segments are those that um, would have occurred in the absence of climate change. We can even, using state of the art methods in epidemiology combined with these climate science methods, we can say on any given day, in fact, how much cooler it would have been in the absence of climate change and how many fewer heat related deaths in statistical terms at least would have happened. But there are still some challenges and I don't want to come across as naive about how this sort of scientific insight might be interpreted legally. As I mentioned before, greenhouse gas emissions are fungible, they combine in the atmosphere and as I say, it's not the case that one hurricane was caused by Exxon, the next by Chevron. But legally, this is not um, exclusive to climate change. It's not a novel issue. There are many other impacts of um, certain human activities that um, combine in their contributions, lead to combined effects. And courts, using market share or proportional approaches, have found ways to allocate damages among defendants according to the proportion of emissions for which they're responsible. It would also be possible, as I said earlier, to quantify specifically what the magnitude of impacts would be in the absence of any one defendant's contributions, if need be. There's also the issue that I flagged right at the start, that the sorts of impacts of climate change we talk about in general are not these totally novel phenomena, that heat waves would have happened in the absence of climate change that storms could have happened too. Again, we're able to quantify how much more likely these events are to occur or how much more intense they are than they would otherwise have been. And once again, there are legal tests available that can understand whether or not the magnitude of these changes attributable to climate change would be sufficient to overcome um, uh, um, 
or overcome causation tests. And then there's the issue that science and climate science and attribution science is far from unique in this context, of course has some sources of uncertainty. When we conduct these studies, um, we have, there's, you know, there's not only one number, but we give often a range of numbers um, that characterize the uncertainty we have um, in our results. It range, it's results from a range of different things, into, including the fact that we have not perfectly observed the world, our models can't perfectly capture all these processes. But we understand really well what these sources of uncertainty are in general. We can quantify just how sensitive results are to uncertainty. And if the findings ultimately are robust to these sources of uncertainty, such that even, account, even essentially accounting for the sensitivity of our findings to these various sources of uncertainty, um, it, we can still demonstrate a contribution of climate change, then this may provide still a robust basis on which to make claims or to interrogate the claims being made. So the sensitivity of our results to these various methodological choices and sources of uncertainty, that can also be evaluated. And these developments in climate science occur in the context of broader changes in climate science that have allowed us to better understand the problem with which we're confronted. It's not only attribution, but also climate change projections give us increasing confidence that we know what will happen to various aspects of the climate system based on the choices made today in terms of how much greenhouse gas emissions are produced in future. We understand to a great extent what the gravity of climate change impacts would be um, depending or contingent on the greenhouse gas emissions we produce over the coming decades. Jan will probably speak more about this um, in the afternoon, but um, with climate change mitigation um, modeling, we have a better understanding of just what we need to do to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. So we know what would happen um, if we continue to vent large amounts of carbon in the atmosphere. We also know where we need to go um, to meet our international obligations, international law um, under the Paris Agreement. And then lastly, there is this point that I've focused on in my remarks, that developments in attribution science, they demonstrate these scientific links between greenhouse gas emissions and companies of companies or countries, the losses suffered by plaintiffs in climate lawsuits. Scientifically, the facts are relatively clear. In principle, all of this could support um, the establishment of legal causation. Now it's really a case of over to the, the lawyers for the legal interpretation side of all of this. And there will continue to be disputes over the um, specific interpretation of the science, but in principle, the facts are clear. Climate change is affecting a wide variety of events around the world. So attribution science, to conclude, has become widely recognized as an authoritative source of insight into the impacts of climate change. The studies that we conduct today can, if necessary, span the full causal chain from greenhouse gas emissions to the humanitarian or economic impacts of climate change. We know, of course, that not all disasters are direct or even substantially caused by climate change. But when that is the case, we are able to demonstrate just to what extent climate change is causing these impacts. One consequence of this for the legal community, of course, is that it's very important that we understand before bringing any one case whether or not it would be well grounded scientifically. And so there is a need to make sure that ahead of time, um, we're, well, there's this appropriate consultation between lawyers and scientists on the merits of certain claims, such that when the facts come to be interrogated in court, um, they stand up to scrutiny. But ultimately, the extent to which climate change is responsible for causing a wide range of climate-related harms um, can be quantified scientifically. And now it's up to the legal community to evaluate what those scientific facts mean in the context of legal standards of proof. So thank you very much. And I look forward to continuing to discuss um, in the Q&A and uh, over coffee and lunch. Thank you very much, Rupert. Um, <clears throat> we are perfectly on time. It's 11.01. I have just one short question to you. You have alluded a lot to we. Could you explain a little bit who we is? 
Where are you talking from? I think when I was using we in this context, um, primarily I was referring to myself and my scientific colleagues um, who can, can and do conduct these sorts of studies. Um, it's of course, you know, we, we have um, as a scientific community, uh, you know, a range of methods, different approaches for answering these sorts of questions. And so it's not the case that everyone's doing exactly the same thing. Um, but I th yes, I, I think I was primarily using it um, sort of rhetorically to refer to what the scientific community as a whole is able to offer as insights and evidence in these, in these sorts of settings.